This video was made possible by our patrons on Patreon. To get access to videos like this early, see behind the scenes bloopers and other such fun things, as well as this stupid sticker, head on over to my Patreon. Link in the description. Here's a question for you. Who is your favorite YouTuber? Don't fucking lie to me. I love asking this question because very rarely will you ever get the same answer from a majority of people. Sure, there's the usual suspects, but ask this question to enough people and you're bound to hear some names thrown around that you might not have even considered before. As a matter of fact, someone's favorite YouTuber can tell you a lot about them. Things like their interests, hyperfixations, goals, personal beliefs, style of humor, and at times even their politics. That's one of the double-edged swords that come along with the proliferation of mass media. Even the most passive consumption of entertainment can speak volumes about the person watching it. Even more interesting, to me at least, is how someone's favorite YouTuber can change over time. If you've been chronically online like myself for the past 15 plus years, chances are that your favorite YouTuber has changed about as much as you have, as your interests, politics, or entertainment preferences gradually evolve over time. If you asked me the same question I posed to you earlier, the answer would undoubtedly change depending on the time period. As a younger man, I might have pointed to DIY prop YouTuber Violet's Tutorials as my favorite. May they rest in peace. Later in life, I might confidently tell you that it was Frederick Knudsen for his fascinating deep dives into internet culture and phenomenon. May he rest in peace. But the topic of discussion for today is a YouTuber that I used to watch near religiously through my junior high years, Stephen McCullough or Boat Saxon 07. Known mostly for his Doctor Who toy reviews, Steven was a staple of my early teen YouTube watch history. With his many spoilerific reviews, toy unboxings, and modification madness videos illuminating the late night corners of my mom's dingy basement. In time, through his personal vlogs, short films, and other creative projects, I began to learn more and more about the man. Steven was never shy to share his personal woes with his viewers, frequently asking them for financial help to better support his aging parents. These emotional appeals help to give a certain humanity to Steven and his videos, with even his worst performing content still possessing that same humor and personal touch that I and many other of his viewers had grown accustomed to and come to appreciate and count on over the years. But why am I spending so much time talking about him out of all the other YouTubers I used to enjoy? Well, chances are you know why. So, I don't usually cover this sort of topic, but this story is just so dark and disturbing, I just had to cover it today. This is Natalie McNally. She was 32 years old and pregnant with her first child when stabbed to death in her home just before Christmas. Detectives from the major investigation team have now launched a murder investigation following the death of Natalie McNally. And to my knowledge, this is the first case where a live stream was used as an alibi in a murder case or anything of that magnitude. The YouTuber is at the center of this murder case because prosecutors say that he faked a live stream to cover up for killing a pregnant woman. And the person accused of the murder is a man named Stephen McCullough. This is the story of Stephen McCullough. Her own boyfriend, Stephen McCullough. So he's just an absolute monster. Yeah. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Most people who've covered the Stephen McCullough case have only become familiar with his YouTube channel and content as a result of the tragedy, but as someone who's watched Stephen's content and even been inspired by it over the years, I'd like to offer my views on the man, the tragedy, and what we can learn about the all-too-common mistake of idolizing our online peers. So. Full disclosure, we're going to be talking about some really dark and depressing stuff in this video essay that I don't normally get into. And out of respect for that and for the subject material as a whole, this video is going to be very light on jokes. It's probably not going to have many to begin with, and it's going to be, again, covering some really fucking sad shit. But I also want to specify why I'm making this video, and it's not to insert myself into the situation or try to make this about me. In no way do I want to do that. But... Most of the people that I've seen covering the accusations against Steven are people who have never watched his videos before or weren't former fans like myself and like a lot of other people. And I think it's important to provide a perspective on this situation from someone who used to both be a fan of his but was massively inspired by it. So without further ado, let's keep going. Stephen McCullough began his YouTube career back in April 5th, 2010. 
going by the name of Vote Saxon 07, a reference to the Doctor Who three-parter Utopia, The Sound of Drums, and Last of the Time Lords that came out a few years prior. The three-parter centers around the return of titular Doctor Who villain, The Master, as he travels back in time and assumes the moniker of Harold Saxon before running for Prime Minister of the UK with hopes of enslaving and systematically annihilating all life on Earth. Basically, um, end of the world. Huh, must have been a Tory. Given this explicit Doctor Who reference, it should come as a surprise to few that much of Stephen's content would center around reviewing toys, action figures, and other paraphernalia from the show. Though in time, Stephen would branch out to talking about other hyperfixations, like Robot Wars, Star Wars, Marvel, and lots more. Equipped with only a crappy phone camera, a crappier cardboard box background, and a lighting setup that would put the fewer bunker to shame, Stephen set about making his dream of YouTube content creation a reality. His early videos really weren't much to write home about in regards to their production value or overall quality, but Stephen's voice and passion when talking about these toys is what consistently kept viewers like me interested. Uh, his pull, oh, pull back and go feature works a little bit too well. So I went careering off the table and I almost destroyed it, which would be a shame. Regardless of how bad the video quality was, Stephen never failed to bring a personal charm and interest to whatever he reviewed, endearing many a viewer in the first few moments alone with his soon-to-be signature opening. Hello YouTube viewers and random Robot Wars fans. Hello YouTube viewers and random Doctor Who fans. Hello YouTube viewers and random Back to the Future fans. Hello YouTube viewers and random Toy Story fans. While his execution was, to put it nicely, crude, Stephen's love for reviewing all things nerdy and weird were clear for all to see. And in time, the video and production quality began to mirror that passion, as Stephen eschewed the old crappy phone camera and makeshift cardboard backdrop for a professional camera setup and a slick new white background for his reviews. Speaking of his reviews, Stephen's content began to find its footing, gradually becoming more and more formulaic, but not in a bad way. Each video will begin with his signature catchphrase, followed by a cursory overview of whatever product he was reviewing, often followed by him either praising, or more commonly, heavily criticizing the product in question, often to great comedic effects. This is frankly pathetic. It's made from plastic, and the build quality feels exceptionally per... Not intended for children. They expect adult collectors to pick up this piece of... And they have the goal to call it a replica, and uh, it's horrible! Did I mention he was 26 when he made this? Occasionally a skit or surprise cameo from a friend or family member might appear to shake things up, but for better or for worse, Steven's toy reviews remained fairly predictable from video to video. And to viewers like me, that was fine. It wasn't pushing any boundaries or reinventing the wheel, but it didn't have to. Sure, at the end of the day, it was just some grown dude ranting about toys made for children, but fuck, dude. The man just had a style about it that made you want to come back and watch more. Call it a comfort YouTuber or whatever you want, but the point I'm trying to make here is that Steven was starting to find an audience. An audience that would only encourage him to branch out his style of content even further. And branch out he would. As to commemorate hitting 1,000 subscribers, Steven gave the internet a glimpse into his second favorite obsession. Filmmaking. Welcome to the 1,000 subscribers video, which is absolutely us so insane. Steven's short films are bad. That's not a subjective opinion, that's an objective fact. Complete with cringeworthy dialogue. Ha! That's just the sonic screwdriver. What are you gonna do with that, eh? Yeah, it's just a sonic screwdriver. But I'll tell you what, it's very, very good at disabling emotional inhibitors. Oh god, I'm ugly! Oh god, no! Poor editing and plot lines so thin it had put most public school toilet paper to shame. But despite all of that, these short films would similarly have the same personal flair and passion as all of Steven's other videos. 
Sure, they were bad, but you could tell that he was having an absolute blast making them. And to the many loyal viewers who had come to love Steven's work, that's all that really mattered. Years would pass, more toy reviews would come, and gradually, Steven's adeptness at video creation would get better and better. He began to become more inventive with his content, no longer content to simply make toy reviews, but instead heavily modify them to look more screen accurate in his Modification Madness series, a personal favorite of mine. Additionally, Steven would also become much more vulnerable in his videos as well, asking his viewers to help him financially support his aging parents and going on to create memorial videos for both his mom and dad after their eventual passing. Steven would frequently feature his parents in his toy reviews, often for the sake of comedy or to add a level of wholesomeness, a fact that made their subsequent passings all the more impactful to not only Steven, but his audience as well. However, this did not slow down Steven's will to create YouTube content, as more toy reviews, Doctor Who rants, and other nerdy endeavors would abound in the years to come. Though soon, Steven would find himself breaking out of the restrictive bubble of the internet and YouTube, and instead, making his way to TV. Among the many topics and properties Steven would review merchandise from, a personal favorite of his would be that of the UK TV program, Robot Wars. To say that Steven was a fan would be a huge understatement, as even his earliest videos showcased his adoration for the series, both by reviewing products from it as well as showing off his crudely made cardboard creations of it when he was a child. So I thought I'd start off today by reviewing some of the toys that I made that were later made into pullbacks themselves. I built it as something that Chaos 2 could flip around with because I only had Chaos 2 and Razor and I wanted something that I could actually destroy and take apart. So this is Panic Attack, as you can see, it's made from a little piece of wood. I mean, look at this. This is literally the Robot Wars version of fan art. And this love would remain consistent through the years, with Steven's praise and promotion of the program eventually resulting in him, to his own great surprise, being able to join it. Joining the group Team S-Tech during the show's ninth season, Steven and fellow content creator Anthony Murney would work behind the scenes as media relations, before eventually joining the televised team in Series 10. By all accounts, things were looking great for Steven. A childhood dream had come true. He had successfully broken out of the realm of just being some guy from YouTube, and speaking of, his channel and content only grew in quality, as his meeting of and subsequent collaboration with Anthony Murney would shift his channel into being a more collaborative effort. Sure, toy and spoilerific reviews would still come out, but they were supplemented with BattleBot news and a brand new show called The Drop Zone. Yet, as we're all probably aware, these personal successes wouldn't last. On December 18th, Steven would host a live stream on his YouTube channel called The Violent Night Stream, in which Steven primarily played, among other games, GTA Vice City. The live stream was initially unremarkable, barring the occasional odd comment or technical issue. However, the five hour stream would soon be recontextualized in the most horrific of ways. Natalie McNally, girlfriend to Steven and mother of his unborn child, was found beaten and stabbed to death on December 19th, seemingly killed just the night prior during the events of Stephen's livestream. While initially a suspect for the crime, Stephen seemed to be able to prove his innocence by using the livestream as an alibi, convincing investigators that he couldn't have committed the murder as he was home playing video games and drinking himself to sleep. However, as the case gained more attention and Stephen's story was placed under greater scrutiny, his alibi began to fall apart. To best illustrate what I mean, Let's first take a look at the stream in question. The Violent Night stream began to little fanfare, and was, to many fans of the channel, a little unexpected. Steven hadn't done a whole lot of streaming in the past, and the few posts he made regarding this upcoming stream only went live two hours before it began. The strange air of the stream would only continue with Steven's opening monologue, in which he spent a great deal of time speaking about how he won't be able to answer any viewers' questions or comments in chat due to technical difficulties as well as personal preference. Well, because this streaming software is kind of up the left, it means I can't check the live chat, which is a real shame. So by all means, talk amongst yourselves. I could use my phone to dip in every now and again and uh, check it, but I've decided that I kind of hate live streams where people just sit and read comments and go, oh my God, yes, ask me questions better. So yeah, phones away. 
can't look at the live chat for some bloody reason because if I do it makes it, the whole thing freeze and OBS just screws up. Uh, in fact, I am. I'm still alive. Good. <laughs> From there, things would only become more and more strange. The live stream is littered with strange moments and apparent technical mistakes that, while somewhat explainable at the time, still carried an air of unease. It almost seemed like Steven knew something that the viewers watching didn't, as time and time again, he would hint at a deeper meaning to the live stream's existence. Like I was reading somewhere recently, like the, the amount of police force that we have lost over the last 12 years is just fucking frightening and no wonder crime is on the rise. That's why I like sticking to just doing crimes in a video game. Because I'm a bit of a sadistic bastard, I suppose. But then again, it is a video game, you know. It's not like it's got real world consequences, so who gives a fuck? I need to kill this bitch. I need to take her down. You don't know me. You don't know what I've suffered. Get the fuck out of me, why? Attack, panic, attack. That's what we're doing. Right, pay attention, 007. Uh huh, yeah, that's that's physics. That's that's what would happen in the real world. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely fucking notly. Eventually, after six plus hours of commentary and occasional breaks, Stephen bids his viewers farewell, ending the stream by giving his thoughts on the reason for the season and the significance of Christmas as a whole. I think I'll wrap up this stream with none of you watching at all, um, just by saying Merry Christmas, everyone. It's um, it's a time that we sort of we look forward to and we get excited about whenever we're young, and then as we get older we get much more cynical and stuff like that, and then we reach a stage where we realize it's not about us anymore. It's about the the younger generation and it's about keeping that that love alive and, and passing it on. And I think that's that's something I'm looking forward to doing. According to his testimony to police later, Stephen apparently fell asleep shortly after the stream's conclusion, before waking up the next day, making his way to Natalie's flat, and discovering her body, whereupon he alerted the police. First responders to the scene concluded that Natalie had been murdered the night prior, while Stephen's violent night stream was taking place. Stephen was immediately brought into questioning by law enforcement, though as mentioned before, was discounted as a suspect shortly after, due to the existence of the stream. Now. The burden was on the investigators to create a timeline of events to hopefully shed new light on who could have done this horrific deed. And thanks to a combination of CCTV footage, phone records, and first-hand accounts, we can do exactly that. The following is an hour-by-hour -hour retelling of what happened the night of December 18th, the night of Natalie McNally's murder. Around 7 to 7.10 p.m., a man wearing a gray hoodie, scarf, gloves, and a green ASDA shopping bag is seen walking towards a bus station in Dunmurray from the Lisburn area. After a short wait for the bus to arrive, the man boards it, and as he goes to pay the fare, drops a few coins on the ground. As the man kneels down to collect the change, CCTV footage on the bus shows that he's wearing two sets of gloves, a pair of winter gloves and a pair of yellow latex ones underneath, a detail that would later be used to link him to the crime scene in question. From there, the man makes the 90-minute bus ride to Lurgan, near motionless. At around 8.30, the man arrives in Lurgan and begins his way towards the Silverwood Green Developments, where Natalie lived. He's caught on CCTV footage around 8.42, walking past said development, before heading off somewhere else. It's the belief of investigators that his initial passing of Natalie's residence was to check to see if her car was there and her lights were on. The man is seen 10 minutes later at 8.52, now carrying a black duffel bag over his shoulder, once more heading towards Natalie's residence. Police say that her door was not locked, and so the man was able to easily gain entry. Neighbors claim to have heard a woman scream at around 9 p.m. 
31 minutes later, after having been in her apartment for more than 40 minutes, the man is once more caught on CCTV, now having changed his clothes and walking towards Carnegie Street in Lurgan. Sometime between 9.35 and 9.55, the man gets into a phone cab taxi and takes it back to Lisburn, being dropped off there at 11.13 p.m. The next day, Stephen finds Natalie's body, contacts the police, and is brought in for questioning shortly after. Initially, Stephen was discounted as a suspect, since, according to him, he couldn't have killed Natalie that night, since he was live-streaming. Everything seemed to match up with that alibi, as there was more than six hours of evidence to seemingly prove Stephen's innocence of the crime. That was, until it was later discovered that the live-stream in question wasn't live at all. The Violent Night livestream wasn't ever truly live. Instead, having been recorded on the 13th of December into the 14th, it was then broadcasted to his YouTube viewers on the evening of December 18th, a full four days after its initial recording. This, in addition to numerous other discoveries in the case, made Stephen the prime suspect in Natalie McNally's murder. Now, the trial is still ongoing, and so we can't say with complete certainty that Stephen did or didn't do it, at least not legally. However, with this new information in mind, I'd like to go through the complete timeline of that night's events one more time with you, to showcase just how methodical Stephen's alleged actions were for the night in question. At 6 p.m. December 13th, till 12.04 a.m. December 14th, Stephen records himself playing games on his original Xbox, frequently speaking to viewers and acting as if this was being broadcasted live. Four days later, at 4 p.m. on December 18th, Stephen makes three concurrent posts on his Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook about his upcoming livestream in two hours, surprising many at the seeming spontaneity of it. Natalie is among the many who liked his tweet announcing it. Later, at 5.57 p.m., Stephen texts Natalie, Right, I'm away to stream the night away. Wish me luck. Natalie responds two minutes later with, I might have a peek at your livestream later. Stephen's phone is then turned off completely. The stream begins at 6 p.m., beginning with Stephen giving excuses on why he can't check the chat and consistently checking the time. Around 7 p.m., a man matching Stephen's build is seen approaching a bus stop, seemingly coming from the Lisburn area, where Stephen lives. He waits for a bus, boards it, and remains near motionless for the remainder of the ride, all while the live stream continues to be broadcasted. The man exits the bus at around 8.30, making his way by Natalie's flat, and then coming back a few minutes later to enter her residence and kill her. The man remains inside Natalie's house from 8.53 p.m. until 9.31 p.m. At around 9.27 p.m., Stephen's stream apparently has a technical glitch in which a poster for the movie No Time to Die is briefly seen. This is being broadcasted at the same time Natalie's murderer is in her house. The man leaves the residence a few moments later with new clothes on, making his way towards Carnegie Street in Lurgan. The man enters a phone cab and tells him to take him to Lisburn so that he can see his ill mother. It was later discovered that someone else had called the cab as the driver was initially going to be making a trip to another location in Lurgan. The man seems to have opportunistically taken the cab to head back to Lisburn. Later, the man is dropped off in a residential neighborhood at 11.13 p.m a short distance from Stephen's house. The man then exits the vehicle before making his way towards Stephen's residence, before coming back to pay the driver and removing his two bags from the trunk. Stephen's phone is then turned on for the first time in over five hours at 11.16 p.m. The pre-recorded live stream concludes at around 12.04 a.m. Digital analysts working on this case discover later that the file for the live stream was subsequently deleted off of Stephen's computer just five minutes later, at 12.09 a.m. The next day, Stephen is seen taking out the bins before making the long trip to Natalie's flat later that day, where he would then discover her body and contact the police. Stephen is arrested at the scene, but is later released on police bail later that day, and then unconditionally. In the weeks that followed, Stephen would visit Natalie's grieving parents several times, at one point, seeming to accidentally leave his phone behind at their house before coming back to retrieve it 40 minutes later. It was discovered later 
that Stephen's phone was recording Natalie's parents the entire time. It is the belief of investigators that Stephen did this to ascertain whether they suspected him of committing the murder or not. On January 28th, a rally would be held in Natalie's hometown of Lurgan, dedicated to Natalie's memory and with the hope of shining a light on and helping to fight violence against women. More than 1,000 people attended this rally, including Stephen. Three days later, on January 31st, Stephen would be promoted to the main suspect of the case and was subsequently arrested. He would be formally charged with her murder just two days later. Stephen's apparent involvement in this case completely recontextualizes the fake livestream and his odd behavior within it. What had been once written off as just general gamer talk while playing Grand Theft Auto was now given a horrifying new angle. Stephen's insistence that the stream was real and that he couldn't check the chat because of technical issues, in truth, was a thinly veiled excuse meant to trick viewers into thinking that what they were watching was actually being broadcasted live. His various comments about I need to kill this bitch. And... Get the fuck out of me way. And... Because I'm a bit of a sadistic bastard, I suppose. Now given new meaning. Perhaps no moment is more telling than when Stephen makes a direct reference to Natalie. That's... that's what would happen in the real world. abso fucking Natalie. <laughs> abso fucking Natalie. Prosecutors charging Stephen with the crime pointed the fake livestream as clear premeditation a fact that is hard to dispute given how it seems as if Stephen had his entire route and plan of murder planned out. The stream's length was no coincidence, and one could make the argument that its length was Stephen deliberately giving himself enough time to leave the house, kill Natalie, and then to return home before it ended. We see this with Stephen's frequent checking of the time during the early portions of the stream, to the fact that, at the time of its recording, Stephen had planned out a rough estimation of how long the horrific events of that night would take place. From the time it would take him to walk to the bus stop, to the length of time the bus would take to get to Lurgan, to, most horrifically, the general time frame in which the murder would take place. The man who murdered Natalie entered her house at 8.53 and left at 9.31. Though just four minutes earlier, prior to his leaving, Stephen's stream would depict the aforementioned movie poster. It's not a stretch to say that Stephen, if he did kill Natalie, had the entire thing planned out, up to the general time frame in which he'd be doing the crime in question. Enough so to literally have a tongue-in-cheek reference to when the murder would take place, literally depicting the words, time to die. And if you'll remember, the live stream was pre-recorded. If this was truly a technical mistake, and if Stephen wanted, he could have had this edited out, but for him to do so, it would have actually had to have been a mistake. No, it was placed there intentionally. In fact, so much of this stream seems so intentionally sinister. What with Stephen's constant allusions to Natalie and crime, his frequent smirks and knowing looks into the camera, to the very name of the live stream, The Violent Night. It almost seems intentional as if he was so sure he would never be caught that he chose to actively taunt the audience members watching it. The trial against Stephen is ongoing. At this time, we have no clue when or if justice will be served. Only that Natalie McNally, partner of Stephen McCullough for four months and expectant mother of a baby boy named Dean, lost her life in one of the most horrific and senseless ways. Like I said before, we can't say that Stephen is 100% guilty as the court proceedings have not yet finished and, true to any functional justice system, the accused are innocent until proven otherwise. But after all we've discussed here and all that's been uncovered over these past few months, it's not hard to come to your own conclusion. But where do we go from here? What do you do after you discover that someone you used to look up to and was once inspired by is revealed to be capable of such horrific acts of evil. I feel like this is a question that almost everyone using this platform has to contend with at one point or another. While hardly ever as severe and horrifying as taking another person's life, many people's favorite content creators have, at one point or another, been proven to be not the people they say they are. 
And yeah, I realize it's privileged as hell to try and quantify this situation from my own perspective, as I and most of Steven's fans didn't know any of the individuals involved personally. But I still think it's worth talking about. Content creators on this site, for better or for worse, are all potential role models, or inspirations to others. Moreover, YouTube allows for its creators to present a level of humanity and personhood that you don't really get from a lot of other mediums like film or TV. Not many people feel like they know their favorite actor or musical artist on a personal level, at least not like how many people do on YouTube and other websites similar to it. Depending on who you watch or interact with, your favorite content creator could give you a myriad of glimpses into their lives, ranging from their hobbies and interests to their family and the state of their mental health. It's not surprising that so many fans say that they feel like they know their favorite content creators on a personal level, or go so far as to call them their friend. Make no mistake, these situations are always parasocial, regardless of who it's applied to, but at the very least, you can see why people have an easier time falling into that worldview online. I'm not ashamed to say that I did. Steven's work and videos were massively inspirational and formative for me as a younger man. It's the reason I can go on and on about his style of reviewing and his passion for content creation. At one point, his videos really meant something to me. To give you an idea of what I mean by that, I mentioned earlier that one of my favorite series that Steven created was called Modification Madness, where essentially he would Frankenstein together existing toys and stuff like that into new ones that were more screen accurate or that he just didn't care about and wanted to make new stuff out of and, you know, without a whole lot of rhyme and reason. A lot of the time, the execution was poor. It wasn't super well done. But I fucking loved that series back in the day. Because when I was younger, I did a lot of that too. Creating something out of existing stuff, whether it be toy guns or existing props or other random shit that I had lying around to create something new, was a really big pastime of mine. One that I really liked. And to see someone not only doing that, but doing that for a hyper fixation for myself at the time with Doctor Who was massive, was amazing to me. I, I loved that series because not only was it just fun to watch and interesting to me, but because it inspired me. It inspired me to do it myself. And I did. This is my shittily made sonic screwdriver that was inspired by Steven's work, that was inspired by his Modification Madness series. It is not particularly well done. It is ultimately just a gray hunk of shit, but I made this because his work inspired me to do so. His work meant something to me. And now something that I had created as a result of that once existing love for his content and for his videos and for modification madness and in a way for him as a creator. Now when I look at this, I can't help but think about what's happened as a result. What's happened since then and the person who I thought that Steven was and who he actually is. And I'm not the only one that feels that way either. Go look at Steven's most recent video and community post, and aside from all the people justifiably disgusted with him, you'll see a ton of comments from people who once knew, lucked up to, or felt like they knew Steven on a personal level, trying to cope with the fact that, in the end, they never really knew him at all. As someone who I considered a friend, what you have done is beyond incomprehensible. I used to watch you back when I was seven. You made these sonic screwdriver modification videos and they were absolutely everything to me back then. I've been watching Vote Sax in 07 for the better part of 10 years and never in a million years did I think this guy would be a murderer. I heard about what this man did yesterday and was horrified. This man was one of my favorite YouTubers when I was a lot younger. I never knew him personally, yet it feels like a big betrayal. No words can describe how I feel right now. I watched this guy when I was younger, and I'm so disappointed at what happened. Rest in peace, Natalie. Steven's channel, content, toy reviews, and personality meant something to all these people. It meant something to me. And now, that's all been thrown away. Stephen McCullough is a harrowing reminder that regardless of how many glimpses you're given into someone's personal life, no matter how often they speak to you like you're a friend or close confidant, you don't really know them. 
If Steven has taught us anything, it's that. Regardless of who you watch or what kind of content they make, you need to contend with the fact that they're just a person, capable of committing horrific acts and injustices. It's easy to venerate the ones that bring us joy and that we only ever see the good from, but they're just as human as you or me, complete with all the capacity for evil that comes with that. I know that sounds cynical and a little fatalist, but the alternative is a blind idolization that is, in almost 100% of cases, doomed to one day be disproven. We'll never get rid of parasocial relationships. So long as young and or impressionable people can learn more about, see the inner emotional depths of, or consume the content of people online, this kind of unhealthy, one-sided adoration is bound to repeat itself over and over again. The culture of the internet isn't getting any more private, and even if it was, some people don't need a lot to work with to be able to believe that their favorite content creator is their friend or someone worth looking up to. No, we'll never truly get rid of parasocial relationships, but maybe we can set a standard for what we can do when those relationships are inevitably, in most cases, quite messily, undone. If it hasn't happened already, then one day you'll likely find yourself in a similar situation to myself and Steven's past fans. Feeling betrayed, disgusted, and trying to make sense of something so senseless. You may regret ever thinking that you knew this person, regret having devoted so much of your time to watching and interacting with their content. Chances are, God willing, they won't have done anything as severe and evil as what we've discussed here but they may still one day do something to make you feel the same way I and others do. So I ask again, what now? What do you do when someone who was once a staple of your YouTube viewing is, for all intents and purposes, a monster? How do you cope with that? Can you? Truthfully, I don't have that answer. There is no roadmap to grief, and the way you and I respond to something like this is incredibly individual. But maybe it doesn't have to be. Not completely, at least. Steven's work and personality endeared a lot of people to him, helped to inspire some like myself, and offered a reprieve from those seeking some kind of emotional escape during moments of great personal pain. All of that was real. All of it meant something. And so the question becomes less of, should you just throw that all away, and more of, can you? In moments like these, I try to look at this from a more productive standpoint. There's no undoing what happened to Natalie, nor is there any saving of Stephen's reputation, especially if he's found guilty of her death. But that doesn't mean that we can't try to put those emotions and feelings we once had about him and his work into something more productive. If his toy reviews, or spoilerific reviews, or modification madness videos brought you joy, or helped you get past difficult times in your life, or even inspired you to do what he did, then I don't think that's something to be ashamed of. The example that Steven set for his work meant something to a lot of people, myself included. And though the man himself will never live up to that example again, that doesn't mean that we can't try to. How you cope and move past those feelings of betrayal are obviously very individual. But I can tell you what's worked for me. Trying to put those positive emotions and memories back into the world. In my mind, maybe the best way to honor the memory of who you once thought these people are is by taking the good that they once gave you and using it to help others. That joy and inspiration was at one point important to many people. And perhaps the best way to cope with what's happened and to find some sense of closure is to try and put that positivity back into the world. By supporting causes and people that seek to end the injustices and senseless violence against others. By advocating for the speedy delivery of justice for those that have become victims to that violence, and by supporting those that need it the most. I've included a link to the Women's Aid Federation of Northern Ireland, one of the many non-profit organizations that provide services for women and children who are victims of domestic violence. They've done some really phenomenal work in helping people in situations similar to Natalie's and have been frequent supporters of her family and her case. I've made a donation myself and implore any of you who are financially able to, to do the same. The link is in the description. Thank you all for watching this video. I know it's a departure from my previous stuff and is 
a lot more vulnerable than the normal, you know, in your face humor that I do, but I thought it was something worth talking about. Make sure to like and subscribe this video if you liked and subscribed this video. And if you're able to, uh, again, I've left a link to donate to the Women's Aid Federation of Northern Ireland in the description. I've made a donation myself, and if you're able to, I know it'd be a big help. So, thank you for watching, and until next time.